All right, I'm going to tell you guys a joke, but I'm going to give you the punchline telepathically. All right, okay. this is good. A horse walks into a bar. The bartender says, hey, and the horse says, <laughs> Oh, that was good. It is. It's funny. <laughs> no, it, that's not funny. It's funny. It no, is it's just funny. shocking for shock's sake. You have oh, no sense of humor. Sorry about him. Welcome to Skepta Lab. The bunk <laughs> stops here. All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Skepta Lab. I'm Jim Underdown, your host. With me are my dear friends, Matt Walsh and Morgan Walsh. You know Matt from Veep, Unplugging with Eva Longoria. Mm -hmm. Morgan's been on Brooklyn 99. What's your other show? The Games People Play. Games People Play, regular. Yeah. And Matt's an old friend from Chicago, so I'm really excited to have you We're guys happy here. To be happy there. to be in the Skepta Lab. Yeah. It's, uh, it's cool beautiful. Place. It's a wonderful studio and an honor to be here. Yeah, thank you. You didn't have to say that, but thank you. It's an honor. Um, okay, so today, <laughs> today we're going to be talking about telepathy, mm -hmm. which everybody knows what telepathy is. It's the ability to read somebody's mind, or it's the ability to place a thought on someone else's mind. It's been the claim has been around for many, many years. It's probably the application that we test the most for our paranormal challenge. Hmm. So we're just going to go over a lot of the reasons why telepathy is a big load of crap. Uh, was, yeah. Jim, so. Matt and I, you should know this, have been telepathically connected for years. Yeah, uh, it's true. No, no, we, uh, we actually kind of know what the other person's going to say. Like sometimes we even finish each other's sentences. Um, yeah. It doesn't really count. I mean, you guys have been married for a while. Count. Just because you think someone can finish your sentences? sentences? Yes, it that's does mean that. No, telepathy. That's that was it. weird. No, 100%. That was weird. Telepathy. That is not it. All right. Yes, it is. No. Let's get a dictionary. You know what? Let's go downstairs and we'll do a test with the Xena cards right now. That'll show you that yeah. this Fine is. Bring me. your Xena cards. Right, let's go. Break it down. Let's go. I knew you were going to say that. Okay, we are in the Carl Sagan Andrewian Theater. We're going to do a test with Zener cards. These are them plus star, square, circle, and wavy lines. You have a one out of five chance by luck of getting each any of these guesses right. Normally we would do 25. We would start getting excited if you got 11 or 12 or 13 right out of 25. That's not going to happen here. Uh, we're just going to give you guys five and we'll see how you do with five. Sounds okay. good. You ready? Five trials. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get it going and start out with that one. Telepathy only. I predict we get five out of five. Plus. That's one telepathic yeah, I, moment. Yeah, I know. I saw it. That was a beautiful telepathic moment. Okay. Good job, honey. Star. It's our second That's two, telepathic Jim. I can connection. Count. Thank you. Which are captured. You know what? Why don't we turn this chair around and face the other way? Because oh. uh, sure. I uh, nothing personal. Yeah, face that way. How's that? That's good. Good. Now keep your body in between this. Don't let her. Don't tip it over. Wavy lines. How that about is, that, Jim? Yeah, that's a good. telepathic connection. Very good. What you're documenting is a telepathic. <clears throat> nice connection. and low here. Hold this nice and low. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Mm. Ready? Mm-hmm. Circle. <laughs> You can't teach this. It's a gift. You don't have to be that happy about it. <laughs> it's a gift. All right, last one. I can't help it. Circle. 
Okay. Okay, ready? Square. That's five for five. I mean, that's oh. not a chance. No, it's not a chance at all because we faked it. So let's talk a little bit about exactly how we faked this. Did you see it? Let's go over it now. Okay, here's how they cheated. Number one, the plus. Actually caught a bit of light behind the card and you could see right through it. Easy enough. Number two, the star. Matt looked up to the ceiling. He looked up to the stars, which told Morgan it was a star. Number three, Morgan waited till I wrote the answer on. The wavy lines takes three strokes. She counted three strokes with the magic marker. Coincidentally, each one of these Zener cards has a different stroke count. So if you can count the strokes, you know exactly what card it is. Number four was an auditory clue. Matt said, okay. If you notice, Matt emphasized the word OK, which starts with the letter O. Circle. O, that's a circle. She knew which one it was. And finally, the last one was a little sneakier. This is a timing trick. The first thing Matt says starts the clock in both of their minds. He counts out four beats. OK. Four strokes for a square. And then he says the next thing. Okay, ready? And that tells you that it's a square. Square. Those are the five cheats they use, but that's not all the cheats in the world. There are lots of other ones. Okay, so we just saw five ways of cheating at a simple Zener card test. You guys did a good job. It was kind Thank of fun. You. Thank you. It was interesting to see all the ways you could sort of convince someone that you have telepathy. It was yeah. kind of fun to play and do Realize that. Realize how many people are being fooled all the time. Yeah, and the thing is, there's a zillion different ways to cheat at those things. Yeah, and seems it, like whenever there's money at stake, people figure out a way to cheat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's it, the creativity is unbelievable, and it's hard for us to keep up. But one of the ways we do keep up is to talk to experts who know a lot about this. So we're going to talk to our old friend Banachek, who's a mentalist, an illusionist, a magician. He's got a show at the Stratosphere Hotel in Las Vegas, and he's as big as they come. Banachek, welcome to Skeptolab. Hi, Banachek. Hello, Jim, Matt, Morgan. Really great to be here. Thank you for speaking with me. It's a pleasure to be on Skeptic Lab and to talk about my experience with telepathy. Banachek, you've made a career out of magic and mentalism and illusion, uh, and you've also been a great friend to the skeptical community. Can you give us a little bit of an idea, like what do you tell people when they see something that seems impossible, what's your answer to that? We can't know everything. Even magicians can be fooled. Penn and Teller's TV show, Fool Us, that is a TV show where the whole premise is amateur magicians, other professional magicians, fooling two of the greatest magic minds in the entire universe. And people still do it time and time again. So in the case of telepathy, what sort of things are you looking for? What should we be looking for as skeptics? So I can't talk to you what all skeptics look for when they're investigating telepathy or other type of psychic phenomena, but, but I can talk to you what I look for, and I look for patterns. I look for patterns prior to the setup, during the actual demonstration, and after the demonstration. They might say, why after the demonstration? So let me give you an example. For four years, I convinced scientists that I was a genuine psychic. You can look it up online. It's called Project Alpha. And one of the tests was a little fuse box. They would put a fuse in this box and they would run a current through it. And that fuse would blow in approximately 14 seconds. My job, shorten the life of the fuse. I found out that if I just barely touched the fuse, I could break the contact. And it would appear that that fuse had blown. So it was blowing the fuse at three, four, or five seconds. Now there was a pattern afterwards. I was going to have to switch that fuse because that fuse hadn't blown. So it was I who actually picked up the fuse every time and in a very perfect way made a switch and set it off to the side. But had they been looking for patterns, they would have realized that I'm doing that every single time I'm blowing the fuse. But when the fuse doesn't blow, I'm not doing that. So what advice would you give people about how to look at telepathic claims? 
Look, here's the thing about telepathic claims. In hundreds of years of this type of phenomena, not once has telepathy been proven on a proper scientific protocol. That should tell you almost everything you need to know about telepathy. It simply cannot prove itself. Therefore, more than likely, telepathy does not exist. All right, Banachek, we'll never hesitate to call you if we need some advice. Thanks for your help, and thanks for being on SkeptaLab. Bye, Banachek. Okay, so we looked at a few ways to cheat and trick people, but now let me ask you guys a question. What percentage do you think of the people who apply and come and get tested for our quarter million dollar prize, mm -hmm. what percentage of them cheat in order to try to win the money? All of them. 50%. The answer is 0%. They all, 100% really? of them believe that they have this ability and some of them are actually shocked that they can't do it. Oh. Wow. Is that surprising? <laughs> that is surprising, yeah. Yeah. So then the question is, why does that happen? Which brings up our next subject. Especially with the telepaths, a very high percentage of them appear to be suffering from some kind of mental illness. Now, mm -hmm. Matt, you're a psych major? Uh, I was a psych major in college, but only a B minus average, so okay. I don't remember a lot. Maybe a C, okay. and it was a long time so ago. So not a brilliant career. Not a brilliant it. scientist by any stretch. But you might recognize some of these indicators that we're going to talk about, because mm -hmm. uh, they really do sort of seem like it's mental illness. We're, we're not diagnosing people. Yeah, I mean, way. you're not a doctor. You're a skeptic. I'm a skeptic. I'm not a doctor. But... Right. Um, we do see these things that are common traits, and we're going to actually talk to someone who is a doctor, he's a psychiatrist. And by the way, on our team, we have four psychologists and a psychiatrist. Well, just to be clear, you have no business being a psychologist or pretending to no. be a doctor because you're not that. You're not, not a me. You're a skeptic. I am not the You doctor. couldn't shine their shoes. No. Okay. Just Nor could you. You're Nor not could a I. Doctor. Right. Nor could I. B minus, right. Yeah. C. So we went and talked to a psychiatrist who really does know what he's talking about and had a little visit with John Suarez, who is a psychiatrist and has a lot of experience in the skeptical world. So let's take a look at that visit. John, thanks for being here. Uh, just for our audience, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your qualifications? My name is John Suarez. I'm a retired psychiatrist. I was uh, on the faculty of UCLA as a professor and also the founder and director of the section on law and psychiatry. I've been involved with the investigations group since the beginning, which I reminded me today uh, was over, started over 20 years ago. The thing I've promoted the most, if you'll recall, is good interviews with the candidate before and after the testing, which I think teaches us a lot about how paranormal thoughts and ideas develop. So you've been on this scene for a long time and you've seen a lot of these people apply to be tested for our prize money. Are there certain indications or signs that you see that lead you to believe that some of these people are suffering from mental illness? Unfortunately, yes. I would say that the applicants, a high percentage of them are overtly quite disturbed. And that shows up just in the way they fill out the application, the data they put in it, the way they phrase themselves. And, and uh, there are many red flags, many signs that they are suffering from fairly uh, serious illnesses. It's a situation where either they are under control by somebody else or they can control other people, all of which feeds into the, the disturbance that they're insecure, they feel threatened, and by having extra power gives them a little better defense. So we're not around these people enough to do a full-blown diagnosis of them, but we can get a pretty good idea, is that right? about some of their issues? 
Oh, yeah, I think that uh, a person-to-person -person interview, say, before the, before the test, uh, a skilled uh, psychologist, and even most of your group, would be able to tell that this individual is suffering from psychotic symptomatology right now. So one of the questions we ask in our screening and in the application for people is, at what age did you first discover your ability? Why is that a relevant question for us to ask? Well, I think it's very helpful for a number of reasons. One is, how long has a person thought or been aware that he had this unusual talent? And also when it started. Both of those are very valuable to us, I think. In terms of length, if the person has been telepathic for 20 years and hasn't done anything with it in terms of gaining power, or gaining money or whatever, it makes you realize that it, they're, they're really disorganized. Secondly, the age of onset is important. Uh, most of our uh, non-organic psychotic difficulties begin in late childhood, early adolescence, at the latest early adulthood. And a lot of these uh, telepaths, as I recall from looking at many applications, uh, have an onset just in that time frame, typically late teens, early, very early adulthood, which is consistent with the onset of schizophrenia in most people. And after dealing with them for a little while, do you think it's okay to explain to them that what you may be experiencing is, might be due to suffering from some condition? It's touchy because we're getting into the realm of diagnosing or at least identifying something. Uh, but I think in, in, in the context of the discussion, this is why a post-test discussion is important also. But in that context, if they, are, if they seem to be amenable or open, we can certainly make the suggestion that uh, this could be a problem that may be helped and that they could, uh, that we recommend that they check out with a doctor or a mental health professional to see what they think. So after we see one of these indications or multiple indications, do you think, is it okay for us to still go ahead and test people? Well, I think at that point, we've gone far enough that we have to follow through. Uh, doing otherwise, in other words, stopping the process, might be misinterpreted in many ways. But in general, I would say we can still follow through and do the test. We try to be pretty nice to people and compassionate about them. How do you think we do? do we, are we okay with people after they fail the test? Well, that's difficult. And I, I think we've seen the whole range of possibilities and over the years. Uh, some of them are uh, taken pretty well. Some of them quickly project the blame, the fault for the poor result to either us or the, the other person in, involved in the transaction whom they provided typically. And I think the more we do, and we've done quite a few already over 20 years, the better we're at it. I think we're doing okay. John, thanks so much for helping us out. You've been a great, valuable part of our group for many years, and uh, we thank you for your help today. Now, I can't believe I'm saying this, but just because you're mentally ill, that doesn't necessarily preclude you from having telepathic ability. Because otherwise, you could say we're not going to test you because you're crazy. Yeah, that would not be fair. And in fact, we had a couple of guys who came all the way down from Seattle on a bus to be tested for telepathy mm -hmm. and showed up stewed to the gills, <laughs> this much left in a bottle of vodka. Really? For the test? And what did you do? Did for you the... drink with them or did you <laughs> test them? Well, it was kind of tempting, but we kind of sat down and decided what to do and decided that being drunk, being, being mentally ill, none of these things were like disqualifiers. So maybe they needed to do that too. So we tested them. They said, the guy said he could guess 48 out of 52 playing cards that were flipped over. Okay. Really? And, um, and what happened? Well, um, he went 0 for 52. <laughs> 0 for 52? Yeah. Oof. Um, if he would have guessed the same card every time, he would have gotten one. 
Um, so it didn't go well from him. But so being drunk doesn't make you telepathic. No, not it doesn't help. Not for him. But Damn it. we did in that test trial. Him. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, we tested him and uh, listen, I was nice to him. Yeah, yeah, of course I'm you sure. Okay, I just want to cover one more thing to look at the brain itself and talk about its capability for telepathically. So what I did is I got a little model of a brain here. Oh, that's a kidney. Yeah, yeah. Not a doctor. Um, who's got the brain? Oh, thanks. So the point I'm trying to make here is in order for this telepathic transaction to happen, there has to be a transmitter and a receiver, and there's nothing on this. A neuroscientist would tell you there's nothing in a brain that could do that. Hmm. Okay. But you're not a neuroscientist. You're right. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a neuroscience, but I do know one. And her name is Indre Viscontis. She's got her PhD in cognitive neuroscience from UCLA. And she's going to settle this little discussion right now. Indre, thanks. Welcome to Skeptolab. Hi, Indre. Hey, Jim. Nice to see you. Hi, Matt. Hi, Morgan. My question to you is, is there any part of the brain that acts as a transmitter or a receiver that could handle the type of telepathy that we've been talking about? Well, so I think we're already starting from a misconception, which is this idea that brain cells send electrical signals to each other. They don't. The electricity in the brain really is kind of contained within a neuron, and the signals they send to each other are largely chemical. So these little electrical impulses might go down sort of the projection of a neuron, but at the end of it, where there's a gap between neurons, there is an exchange of chemicals, not electricity. So that's your first problem. But yeah, beyond that, the amount of electricity coming off of the brain is, of course, tiny. And so it's not going to be able to make it through the air. And even if it did, it's not like that is really the language of the brain. So we can measure electrical signals from the brain from populations of neurons, from many, 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 many cells. But that's sort of like the large scale sig signal. That's not the fine granular details of thinking. But there are fMRI machines, right, that track brain activity. So can't we see? So yeah, fMRI and other tools that we have to look at what's happening in the brain, either in terms of blood flow or these electrical signals like in EEG, we're learning a lot. And we're able to now kind of understand much more about sort of the different levels at which the brain communicates. So there is some communication that happens, it seems, on the course of like synchronizing many, many neurons together. Um, and that there is some information that's coming in terms of sort of like how, what, what the sort of shape and phase and style of a brainwave is. But we're a far cry away from being able to predict what somebody is thinking on the basis of this kind of measurement. I mean, again, the closest thing that we could get is maybe we could predict what kind of picture they're looking at because then we could just look at some of these primary sensory regions like vision, um, or maybe like what they're thinking about in terms of what kind of a sport they're imagining playing, because then we can look at motor cortex, which also, you know, is a little bit more predictable. But when it comes to things like thinking about love or, you know, other sort of complex human emotions or experiences, we're not there yet. I have a question. So, are there other reasons besides mental illness that could cause a brain to malfunction or hallucinate? Yeah, there are lots of ways in which our brain can induce hallucinations or other kind of mental experiences that don't involve mental illness or even drugs. I mean, drugs is the easy one, right? We know we can change the way we think by taking drugs. But the brain doesn't like to just sit in a vacuum. It, it needs to be entertained. So when there's an absence of, of stimulation, like sensory deprivation, let's say you're in a room where there's no sound and no light or anything, you're very quickly going to begin to hallucinate. Your brain is active all the time. It thrives on activity. So when the outside world isn't providing it with any kind of stimulation or anything to respond to, it'll create its own inner world. And yeah, sure, you'll hallucinate. You might hear things. You know, eventually you might start seeing things. 
Um, but you're definitely going to be sort of activated in a way that, you know, you wouldn't if you were like responding to what's out there in the world. When you're tired or stressed or you have a fever, these are all conditions under which you can then also have some kind of a hallucinatory experience. Thanks so much, Indre. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so that was a little bit about telepathy. There's a lot to think about. Yeah, right? we went pretty deep. Yeah. That was good, though. Some crazy stuff there. Learned a yet lot Yet to be of proven, tricks. right? Yeah. Tele telepathic power, yet to be proven. Not proven at all yet. Except in the Marvel Universe, perhaps. M yeah. Okay. On TV, movies, maybe. Fiction, yeah. Right. Reality, Not never. Really. Okay. Um, thank you guys so much. It was great having Our you pleasure. This was a blast to be so in the fun. Skeptolab slash your office. Yeah. Don't, don't, yeah. Okay, this is a blast to be in the Skeptolab. And uh, yeah, um, so what I would like to do, and we don't do this for everybody, but um, I have a number in my head between one and a hundred. I actually wrote it down okay. under here. If you can guess this number, we'll buy the nicest dinner in Los Angeles. But you have to hit it on the head. All right, I'm See reading your mind. I know the number. No way. Thirty-four. Oh, Thirty-four. Is it 34? It is. Walter Payton. Ding. Of course it's Walter Payton. Oh, you love the Bears. What was I thinking? You write that down for everything. Ah! All right. I well, love we're the still Bears, good too. too. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks anyway. Thanks. You owe us dinner. A I really do. nice okay. dinner. I know. It's, P the P it's record. Okay. There's a record of it. Okay. okay. Um, I'm good for it. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Morgan and Matt. Uh, thanks, John Suarez, Indre Viscontes, and Banachek for helping out today. See you next time at Skeptolab. Thank you. So, do you think you could prove paranormal ability under scientific test conditions? Take a shot at our half million dollars. Go to CFIIG.org. And by the way, hit the like button below. Don't forget to subscribe to the CFI YouTube channel for more interesting content.